feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lulin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity Webinar. It is great having you with us today. If you're on Twitter and now X, you might follow Aging Doc. We have the doctor behind the scenes with us, David Basilai, talking about the future of health. Please use the Q&A function to send us all your questions, remark, comments, whatever you want. We are really curious. As always, we start with a short talk today by Anis Hamid, our research assistant at the NUHS Center for Health and Longevity. And she will talk about a very important topic and that's legume consumption, so about food and the risk of all cause and all cause specific mortality. Thank you for the kind introduction. As mentioned, my name is Anis, a research assistant at the Center for Healthy Longevity. And I would like to present a paper on legumes and how they have an effect on mortality. Firstly, I would like to walk you through the mission of the center, which is to add healthy years of life by delaying aging, prolonging disease-free life, and maintaining high functionality. It is also worthy to note that adequate nutrition is key to good health in all stages of life. The paper I will present today is titled Legume Consumption and Risk of All Cause and Cause Specific Mortality a systematic review and dose-response meta-analysis of prospective studies by the first author, Nikan Zargazadeh, and his colleagues. Let's define what legumes are, which encompass beans, peas, and soy. Legumes are packed with protein, dietary fiber, B-group vitamins, magnesium, potassium, phytonutrients, and have low GI. Phytonutrients is a broad term for compounds produced by plant sources, such as flavonoids, carotenoids, and so on. Glycemic index refers to the ability of carbohydrate in food to raise the glucose level in blood. However, in contradiction, legumes also have high phytate content, which impairs nutrient absorption. Phytates are antioxidant compounds that may bind to some dietary minerals such as iron, zinc, manganese, for example. Previous meta-analysis showed varying results of legume consumption and the outcomes. Some studies have missed several cohorts or did not include cost-specific deaths in the analysis. Hence, in this study, objectives are relating legume consumption to risk of mortality in all causes, such as cardiovascular disease, congenital heart disease, stroke and cancer, evaluating the dose-response relationships using systematic review and meta-analysis of studies conducted in the general population. A systematic literature search was conducted on PubMed, Medline, Scopus, ISI Web of Science, and MBAs from inception to September 2022. Prospective cohort studies consisting of adults aged 18 and above were considered, and total types or subtypes of legume consumption were included. Also, risk of mortality from all causes were examined. From the 8,810 records identified through literature search, only 243 potential records were reviewed, and of which 32 cohorts with 31 publications were included in the meta-analysis. 
The included studies were original papers that were carried out in the US, Europe, Asia, Australia, and two internationally, with an enrollment of more than 1 million participants. The total number of deaths reported was 93,373. Here are the key findings from the paper. It has been found that higher legume intake was associated with 6% reduction in the risk of all costs and 9% stroke mortality, but there was no significant association for other causes. Interestingly, each 50 gram per day increase in legume consumption results in 6% reduction in risk of all-cause mortality. However, there have been several limitations identified in this study. The strength of evidence was judged from low to moderate, and there are influences of observed associations, such as method of preparation of legumes, differences in the types of legumes consumed, and changes in consumption over time. To conclude, it is noted that although a higher legume intake was associated with a reduced risk of all cause and stroke mortality, there have been no reported effects for other causes. Hence, this warrants further research to assess the effects of particular types of legumes on the risk of specific chronic diseases and causes of death. I would like to end on a positive note that an increased consumption of legumes is likely to be cost-effective but also bring about health benefits in time to come. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, it's really enlightening. We have today Dr. David Basilai, MD, PhD with us. He is certified by the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine and concentrates his efforts of evidence-based longevity medicine. He is also known as Aging Doc on X, where he has over 25,000 neuroscientists and longevity medicine followers. And he hosts the Aging Doc podcast, where he conducts via sat chats with aging biologists. Dr. Basilai is also founder and CEO of Healthspan Coaching, where he performs one-on-one -on -one longevity and healthspan consultation for his clients. His work has been featured on many channels, for example, Longevity Technology, Lifespan IO News, Vita Dow, and many others. It's very nice, David, that we have you on the show for your fire chat with us today, but before so, we will, of course, give you the floor for a presentation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Andrea. And what an honor to be here. Um, the National University of Singapore is an incredible leader in nationally, internationally. And uh, you and Brian Kennedy are doing such phenomenal things leading the world in this. Um, I start on a poignant note. This talk is dedicated to the memory of Judy Campisi. It was with deep sadness that we learned of the passing of Judy Campisi, a renowned figure in the geroscience community. Judy's groundbreaking work in senescence and SASP has left an indelible mark in the world, and her legacy will inspire and impact generations to come. Thank you, Judy. And um, I'm going to transition us now to, the, to our, our talk today in her honor. So um, uh, thank you so much for the, the lovely introduction. And um, essentially today, I'll, I'll be speaking on the future of health in longevity medicine. This is something that I think is going to impact every facet of our life. It's going to impact the economy and the structure of the world. It's going to impact the quality of our relationships with loved ones, and it's going to affect all of us. It, and I believe this is an, a topic that's particularly important now because these the steps we're taking now are really going to determine how we live our lives, uh, the nature of things. So uh, I'm known as Aging Doc uh, on, on X, and I post on this subject a lot. And one thing that prompted this talk on longevity medicine is I often work with longevity clinics uh, where they work medically, and I'm an MD, but what I do is I do coaching and consulting at aging.com alongside them to help people make educated choices. So the real focus for this talk is on addressing what longevity medicine is and where we want to be going with this in the future as a, as a foundation. So thank you so much. 
So what is longevity medicine? Longevity medicine doesn't have a single uniform definition uh, to it, although pioneers like the Healthy Longevity Medicine Society are working towards unified definitions for longevity medicine, health span, and other bridging work. Um, it relates, however, we can say towards optimizing one's health at every stage of life. And it focuses on improving both the length of our life and its quality of life, something that's often missed. Often it's missed that it's not just about living longer, it's really about living as vibrant as we can, hence the quality of life. So how it does so is it focuses on a specialized, personalized health plan or, or modalities to address and prevent common health issues like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and overall health and functional status. That last category is incredibly important because we think not just about disease, but how to really be as vibrant as possible, as functional as possible, feeling as good as possible. So to maximize our potential at all stages of life. It's also very interdisciplinary, or rather should be at its best. As I see it, longevity medicine integrates geroscience, which is the aging biology underlying mechanisms unifying this, with clinical biogerontology, looking at our, our functional status, our frailty, and health trajectory and independence. And it also looks at precision and lifestyle medicine. So I hope in this talk to be able to unpack it for you a little bit because this is the dialogue that we're having right now as a community. So um, this is one of the, the working definitions out there. This is from um, a Lancet article by Evelyn Bouchef et al. on longevity medicine, upskilling the physicians of tomorrow. There the focus was there's a uh, longevity education initiative by her and, and, and Alex and, and at in silico uh, and others, uh, but, the definition there, let's take a look at that. Now, longevity medicine is advanced, personalized, preventative medicine powered by deep biomarkers of aging and longevity. It's fast emerging. It encompasses likewise rapid evolving areas of biogerontology, geroscience, and precision, or precision, <laughs> say precision precisely, preventative and functional medicine. So I wanna be unpacking all of these areas to disentangle them because I think it starts a dialogue even if we can all think about ways to uh, refine different aspects of it. Like what is a deep biomarker? I feel like to think about as reliable biomarkers that are well validated, which encompasses many forms of data. So another way of frameworking this is that the aims of longevity medicine is we're extending healthy lifespan of the individual while preventing or slowing or reversing age-related decline and maintaining function and quality of life and doing so by integrating advanced modalities, including genetics and simple ones, but hard ones at a personal level, like lifestyle medicine, something I'm very passionate about as a diplomat of the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine, something dedicated, a uh, branch of medicine dedicated to things like diet, exercise, sleep, relationship, stress. Uh, longevity medicine thus is not about extending life simply, but it, making those, uh, adding life to those years, not just years to our life. So, one way to think about this, this, this contrast that I'm drawing between living longer and living better is these two things are very compatible if we get at the underlying basis. One can promote the other, but they're not always linked perfectly in tandem. On the left slide here, we see the fraction of people who are alive. And our path in life is it goes down and down the percentage of us. But what do we see in the black versus the green curve, the solid line, is when we prevent or postpone disease, and when we postpone disease, we have the potential of prevent preventing disease in that if there's another cause of, of mortality, then it has been averted altogether. When we do these things, the curve either becomes more square-like when we increase our average uh, the life expectancy by reducing premature mortality. So people live longer and then up to a certain year and then 
we tend to pass away at around the same time. That's better than a wider distribution where more people die early. Or we might extend our lifespan by pushing the whole curve right in a parallel manner. Again, extending average lifespan, but in that case, maximum lifespan. So that's lifespan. Now let's look at the right. <clears throat> All of our lives are have a part where we're relatively healthy and a part where we're relatively sick. And our health span relates to the time relatively free from illness and feeling relatively better. And the Healthy Longevity Medicine Society is helping us sort of tease apart a uniform, for, uniform definition for this. But the concept is the if we simply if, if all, what we simply live longer, but we don't change how sick we are or when we get illness, all we're doing is we're extending our sick span, which means more cost to society, more of an emotional burden to individuals. But if we're able to extend health span by also delaying the onset or make milder these conditions, we're really adding much more pep, the kind of lives we want. We don't want to be living our lives in, you know, where we, we're living 20 more years, but they're all uh, in like in a bed. We want to be extending our health. So these are important slides to keep in mind. So what I want to do next is to contrast between longevity medicine and several definitions. I spoke earlier about preventative medicine, precision medicine, and lifestyle medicine. So let's unpack that a little bit. Precision medicine offers personalized care based on genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors. Now, longevity medicine can do this too, but it also is targeting aging or longevity or health span. In other words, when we practice longevity medicine, we do better by integrating individualized factors and a lot of data, but it's not sufficient uh, to make it longevity medicine. It's really the target. Likewise, preventative medicine focuses on what we want to do. We want to prevent diseases before it occurs. Longevity medicine can extend our health span by doing so, but longevity medicine also addressing the aging process itself, and it addresses not just preventing, but also ameliorating and addressing the foundational root causes in that manner. Likewise, lifestyle medicine emphasizes behavioral and lifestyle changes, these things I've discussed earlier, such as diet, exercise, nutrition. Longevity medicine thinks these things are absolutely wonderful. But longevity medicine also combines with these the most advanced biomedical technologies. So the goal of longevity medicine thus is not only to prevent or treat diseases, it is to optimize our aging trajectory at all stages of life and to do so in a way that incorporates all these other factors, prevention, lifestyle medicine, and precision medicine. And double clicking a little bit on these uh, two of these paradigms, on the left here, we see one model for precision medicine. You have an individualized patient cloud of data, and you're integrating perhaps bi biological factors such as omics from blood studies, functional markers on patient performance, subjective markers. You're integrating all that data so you can do have the greatest impact on patients at the individual level that's specific to them because the perfect intervention for you is not the perfect intervention for someone else or the average person for that sake. So on the right side, we see the basic tenets of lifestyle medicine, healthful eating, physical activity, managing stress, addiction such as tobacco, sleep, and relationships. And of course, there's much more, but at the, the concept here is illustrated in this little cartoon to, to uh, on, a, on, a, on a lighter note here. So what this cartoon shows us is lifestyle medicine requires patients to be highly active in their own care. So this is a patient, he's talking to his medical provider and he's saying to his doctor, yes, I believe in prevention. So can you give me a pill that will prevent me from having to exercise, to eat less, to stop smoking and drinking? So obviously no such magic pill exists today, right? So until we have such a magical pill, we need to be able to think about 
what we could be doing at a personal level in terms of these health practices that influence our environment and our epigenetics and uh, are enormously powerful. And even if we have great magic pills, to start with the more solid foundation can take us further and faster. I think it's important here to take a step back to think about the underlying basis of longevity medicine, or what I see as evidence-based longevity medicine, as a paradigm for now and into the future. It's the, I'm juxtaposing here aging biology and longevity medicine, with the former being the foundation of the latter. You see, longevity medicine is rooted in geroscience, which is the biology of biological aging, what molecular and, and other fundamental processes contribute to what we observe phenotypically or what we see to the eye and we observe in the function, capabilities, every aspect of aging. So it examines the relationship between biological aging and these age-related diseases we see. We're trying to link these two parts together. The concept is by understanding the basis, we will be that insight will lend to more powerful tools to address it fundamentally. So we're applying that to develop interventions. And by understanding these cellular and molecular pathways, they can be more effective as well as address the roots of chronic diseases. And as we'll see shortly, do so far more powerfully on a theoretical basis than uh, other approaches may. This slide should be familiar to everyone in the audience, the hallmarks of aging. Uh, on the left, the version from uh, 11 years ago now, and on the right, the 2023 version. And what this sort of highlights is that our understanding of what aging biology is, is we're, I, we're scratching the surface. Uh, now, the, the, the hallmarks of aging is a work in process that's why we're seeing a change before and after. There are different paradigms for it, but we're trying to be meth very consistent. So what makes something a hallmark of aging, it should obviously track with aging. And if in an, an experimental condition, if we aggravate it, we should be seeing a worsening of markers or phenotypes of aging. And likewise, if we ameliorate, address it in a positive way, we should be ameliorating or making better those things. And that sounds great. And it, it is very helpful. I believe this is a very helpful paradigm for thinking about some of our contributions, articulating them to public, to uh, in, in grants and discussions, and in actually setting targets. They're, however, ra still incomplete. And we need foundational research to unpack these to make progress. And um, there's a lot more to say about, about that. But one example, for example, is we don't understand causality, which hallmark is causing which, to what degree. We do notice that they tend to track together. But their relative importance in the hierarchy or how much evidence of what types make something a hallmark or where to draw the line. because telomere attrition relates a little bit to genomic instability and some other hallmarks. So let's look at that from another angle. This is in tribute to Brian Kennedy, if you're watching, first author of Pillars of Aging. And this slide simply shows there are many ways of looking at the same problem. We see a lot of overlap, but we also see some differences. But the fundamental biology is the same. And uh, for those interested in a deeper dive about some of the critique on what I think is a very uh, valuable but not uh, in, in, indelible um, framework is the Hoverfly and the Wasp by David Gems and, and Pedro. I do think it's useful, but we need to understand it's less foundational or fundamental than, say, the hallmarks of cancer in which it was based. Um, and we, this is, um, it's an important work. So uh, I think this uh, slide on the right adds some color to our presentation here. These are all, by the way, AI generated, and I'll later be tying AI to uh, this as well. But how do we combat chronic aging? So we, we'd already discussed eight, the function as well as specific conditions, and I would add preconditions. This leads us to the geroscience hypothesis I was alluding to. The concept is if we can address the fundamental biology for these different conditions where 
across these different conditions, we notice that biological aging, if not causative, is at least permissive of an increased probability of developing cancer, of developing diabetes, of developing dementia, of developing heart disease. So since these things are biologically based, the geroscience hypothesis posits that if we are able to address the roots of biological aging, then we're able to more profoundly address more completely these uh, different conditions. Likewise, we're able to address many simultaneously since these underlying roots are the foundation of many conditions. This seems like it has a potential to be more cost effective as well as effective than playing whack-a-mole for every specific sub-disease uh, without looking at what's, what's driving or permitting it. And addressing aging mechanisms is, is the way. Uh, not to spend too much time on this, these are some of the original uh, hallmarks of aging, uh, loss of proteostasis with a protein, um, uh, basic. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, gloss over these, but the, the point of this slide is that they're fundamental basis for all of these hallmarks. Uh, so this is a sort of poignant slide on, on this day uh, because uh, Judy Campisi's, uh, one of her, her uh, incredible contributions is she, uh, it always takes a team, but Judy Campisi, if far and away in my mind, was the foundation leader for characterizing the SASP, the senescence-associated secretory phenotype uh, that senescent cells secrete, understanding they're not only have value in uh, in development and, and wound remodeling and so forth, but that these factors, both locally and systemically, uh, drive pleiotropic adverse events, uh, literally promoting senescence in their neighboring cells as well as uh, direct and indirect harm. And we see here it's all these conditions: heart failure, COPD, Parkinson's, and so forth. And this is part of a larger point that I'm trying to make here as well, which is that not only are all the hallmarks interrelated, so that when we have putative geroprotectors in model organisms, i.e., things that extend longevity in model organisms, addressing the biology of aging, not only do we see um, interventions that affect one hallmark seem to affect other hallmarks, but the opposite is also true, that every single hallmark seems to affect so much. And this is just one other uh, example. In this case, it's mitochondrial biology. And here we see other tissue, cells, organ systems, our systems biology at every level being touched. This brings us to the concept of, so we're talking about bringing this to the bedside. We're talking about evidence. Uh, this is something dear to my heart, evidence-based medicine. My PhD is in health services research, which put another way, uh, which was launched in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, is a PhD in clinical research, trials, outcomes data, uh, investigative work at the clinical level. Uh, and when I was doing my PhD, I was teaching doctors evidence-based medicine. I've also done some reviews on it and been a co-author on a Cochrane systematic review, uh, which is one systematic framework too. So uh, why, why from this background, I think it's important. I think we need solid framework and paradigm to asking how do we connect the dots between the basic science to applying this to the base, uh, to the patient at the bedside, and or to the healthy person optimizing their health. So we want to make sure that it's not only credible but it's effective and safe. What makes us credible as a field, as a discipline, and the still nascent decades later, uh, biogerontology, uh, geroscience, the way we are credible is by proving that we're effective by having interventions that are shown through rigorous exploration. There's a lot of excitement. And I, I'm as excited as, as one can be about our future, but we need to be very rigorous. So one way to think about being rigorous is the hierarchies of evidence. Now, this is a, the challenge here. When we look at longevity medicine and its basis, we don't have any... <laughs> We don't have any trials where at birth we we randomize people to a certain diet or intervention, say, okay, from birth you're only going to eat this and you're not going to eat that. That is unrealistic. It is impossible. It's aside from 
costs and economics time, it's unethical. So for the time being, while we're exploring much more pro powerful tools, such as reliable biomarkers, so we can have shorter term trials, not using death as a endpoint, but surrogates for mortality and quality of life and quality adjusted life years. Um, in, in the meantime, we have, in addition to these surrogates, uh, a need to look at different forms of evidence. So it's not just being at the pinnacle of the hierarchy of evidence, which is systematic reviews that are also meta-analyses, systematic reviews meaning very comprehensive, and meta-analyses meaning a subset of that that have a qu rigorous quant basis in terms of pooled uh, weight averages. So when we apply longevity medicine, we do factor in things like the blue zones, even while recognizing there might be genetic differences in those populations, or maybe it's not what they're eating or it's something else about their lifestyle. We need to use clinical judgment, in other words, in having the best longevity medicine that we're capable of today. David Sackett, uh, he is what regarded as the father of evidence-based medicine. He was a real pioneer. And one of his definitions is it is at the intersection of clinical judgment, relevant scientific evidence, and patient values and preferences. Now, we emphasize a lot relevant scientific evidence. Without that, we're at pure anecdote and we're in a terrible place. But something that I believe is neglected from my framework as a longevity uh, consultant and coach working with clients is we forget about the clinical judgment and the patient values and preferences. Why patient values and preferences? Because every person has different goals. Their situation is different, not just from a precision medicine perspective, but how much of a risk or comfort with risk they have, for example, with the unknown, how much they're reaching for potential benefit. It's a real trade-off, just like in financial planning. You need to understand client goals, medicine, all the more so. And clinical judgment, it does, having clinical experience, with not just with other patients, but this sort of inherently subjective process of asking about different sources of evidence, where I mentioned the blue zones before, there's uh, animal models, but they might be very different than us, but it's better controlled. And we have observational studies, and it might be in humans, but it is more prone to confounding. So we need to be very intelligent and in a inherently subjective, but still methodical, well-reasoned process in applying these principles. So another definition of evidence-based medicine is a conscientious and explicit and judicious use of the best current evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And uh, this, what I'd like to highlight here is simply current best evidence. Current means it's going to get better and we're going to be wrong about some things. Best evidence means we don't know everything now. It means the best evidence we have right now. The alternative to practicing fields like longevity medicine is the status quo. And the status quo is that we, we're, we're all, you know, pass away with a certain amount of time and often in more discomfort and more frailty than needed. So the, the alternative to applying subjectivity is to have something that itself has a downside. So some willingness to explore there is helps take us further than that status quo. This slide here shows what society wants to see and what really we'd like where we'd like to get as close to as as possible too. But people have the illusion of on the left side before, on the right side after that you just take a pill and you, you're going to be young. We are we are far away from this, but. What can we do now while we invest in, in uh, the sort of research that where we attempt to not only slow down biologic aging, but revert or at least improve functional health uh, at, the, at, later, uh, at later periods in our life? So one thing we can do now that is very evidence-based is we can emphasize on risk mitigation. This is something that's being pioneered in major longevity centers, um, such as uh, Qi longevity, uh, human longevity, and others. 
Um, longevity clinics employ advanced diagnostics to identify and mitigate risks associated with aging. So at risk mitigation pertains to a screening for biomarkers of aging and early signs of age-related disease. We intervene early to have better outcomes. If we diagnose someone earlier, maybe we can cure cancer. Maybe they can have better outcomes. These last slides, I'm going to be proceeding uh, more briskly for the sake of, sake of time, emphasizing the key points here. So a major part of this is health surveillance. In longevity medicine, we're following these biomarkers, which is, uh, I think, absolutely instrumental to our field, is to have these early biomarkers so we know whether things are working, both at the research trial level, so we can uncover and discover and validate therapy, and also at the individual level, so we can see are we moving the trajectory in the right direction? I see optimizing health more, less like a destination, more like a flight path. When a flight gets off course, we measure it and we adjust. So we really have things efficient and well. So these are just some examples. I'll skip this slide. You can read that. Uh, this is, again, from uh, Qi Longevity. They have a beautiful framework here where we link on the left side diagnostics, different forms of phenotyping, biological data, digital clinically, and that's inexorably linked to interventions because it's only by truly understanding what the phenomenon that's happening can we know how best to intervene at the patient level. And this is data from, um, uh, from uh, Human Longevity. Um, or health nucleus, uh, in their screening process, 1.7% of the population who were seemingly perfectly healthy, asymptomatic, they had early treatable cancers. It's possible some of these people would have went on to pass away. So we're, we're not yet there in my mind in terms of the best evidence-based guidelines in terms of things that might be more costly to society, but may have enough material benefit that we could take things further. And uh, a big part of this, I think, is showing our cost of effectiveness and prevention, because when we chase after these things after the fact, it's it's an awful quality of life. And for the payers, it ends up being a much higher cost. This is true for treatable aneurysms. If you detect one early, you might repair it or you might monitor more often. So you can look out when it's growing faster to uh, intervene before it occurs. This is true for metabolic states like prediabetes, even our genetics where we might screen differently or have more uh, tuned in biomarkers for ApoB targets, for example, if you have genetic risks for uh, coronary artery disease. Um, I will uh, quickly on this slide, just the, high, the simple one-liner is, AI and longevity medicine <clears throat> is touching every single facet of it, every single one, not just diagnostically and therapeutically, but even drug discovery and design. That's all I'll say there. What are the best practices? Now we're wrapping up our, our, our talk here. Adherence to ethical standards and patient-centered care is paramount, paramount, and continuing practices based on the latest research and trials. And when I say ethical standards, that can be thought at a micro or macro level. At a micro level, I think we need to be doing much better at declaring conflicts of interest and minimizing them. There are a small number of bad players that really give this field a bad name. That's what, one reason I went to on X, what was called Twitter, uh, at AgingDoc1, where I post articles. I wanted there to be a dialogue to shed light on it. I don't tell people what's right or wrong, but I try to create a community that is self-correcting there. But we need to self-correct globally. And patient education is paramount. We want to empower patients because they're really at the center of the kind of change we need. Um, and the challenges, of course, are the complexity now at the macro level. How are we going to face a new society with more older people? And I think one brilliant way that NUS is pioneering is by keeping us healthier, longer, independent. And um, uh, uh, for another talk will be biomarkers of aging and therapeutics. That's for another day. But I do want to highlight NUS's own intensive course on healthy longevity coming up. Andrew Meyer, I'm sure, will be able to speak to that. And uh, of course, uh, Ev uh, Evelyn and Alex 
have pioneered the Longevity Education Hub, which has a relation, which is uh, prominently featured on the Healthy Longevity Medicine Society. Um, so now it's an exciting time. Newcomers can come to the field and learn. And uh, just this last year, the Buck hosted its first international roundtable of longevity clinics, which is fantastic. They had a roundtable table on biomarkers one of the day and one day featuring on longevity medicine clinics. And um, uh, now we have whole new summits uh, for, uh, for uh, more in-depth coverage. I'll be one of the uh, sp uh, sp invited speakers to uh, the May 2024 Longevity Med Society, where I'll be taking a deep dive uh, for people who are already well-versed in the field about um, interventions, testing program applications in longevity medicine, biomarkers of aging next generation, uh, third generation, things like that. Um, and if you're interested, that's a QR code for there, not to be confused with the last QR code. So this is the last slide before the last slide. This is a beautiful symbol, okay? Because it looks so beautiful. Look at the what a beautiful future we have, futuristic. And I believe in the potential of that future. And this was generated by AI, which we talked about. But guess what? Now let's look carefully at the words. They're gibberish. They mean nothing. So we've come so far, but we still have a way to go. So I think this is symbolic of how far we were going, how far we have to go, but the excitement for the future. And uh, I wanna thank the National University of Singapore. I wanna thank you, Andrea, and Brian Kennedy. Uh, NUS and you guys uh, are serving as incredible pioneers of longevity medicine. You really are creating healthy longevity medicine for all what you're doing is an investment to economically across Singapore, um, many fold over the work you two are doing and NUS. And it's a, it's a pay it forward to, to our world because I think these kind of investments um, are what really are going to take us forward. Uh, for those interested in learning more about me, uh, agingdoc.com is where I do direct one-on-one -on -one coaching and consulting with clients interested in talking about longevity. Uh, and there's a QR code if you wanted to scan it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, David. Um, wonderful uh, talk. Let me start. Do we know what really longevity medicine is? We asked that question ourselves, the Council of the Health and Longevity Medicine Society. We started that meeting while having a longevity medicine society, and then the healthy was added. Because we had a huge debate. Is it about longevity? Or is it about healthy longevity? Would you agree with me that healthy longevity might be even more relevant than longevity in itself? I, I couldn't agree with you more, Andrea. In fact, the, behind Barzilai Consulting or agingdoc.com, the name of my LLC is Healthspan Coaching LLC. I really believe, um, like from that slide I was, I was showing earlier, if we simply extended our lifespan but did not delay or mitigate disease, what do we have? We have instead of 10, 10 years of suffering, we have 20 years of suffering, you know, or five, you can pick your number. So none of us, and this is one reason I think, Andrea, that the public, it, it, some a subset of the public who have not been exposed to these concepts are like, no, 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 we live long enough. I don't want to live older because they don't understand. What if we had, I'm taking an extreme case, obviously, I'm not saying this is, this is even possible, but if you told to someone, what about, you know, what about living an extra year, living like you're, you're 20 years old, you're 30 years old, but with all the wisdom and maturity and all these ideas, I mean, um, I've been, and I think about what a contribution it can make to society if we're healthy also. When we're healthy, we're also greater economic contributors too. Yeah. And it's, and, um, you know, serially, I've continued to get degrees in my life. And I, I'd like to think I can give the longer I live in a healthy state, the more I can give. So I couldn't agree with you more, Andrea. It's all yeah. about healthy longevity. Healthy longevity medicine. And they are coming to the lifestyle medicine. Let's tingle, tang disentangle it. Isn't yeah, it yeah. lifestyle medicine? Because they were much earlier also in the creation of it. We have the Society of Health and Longevity Medicine now since one and a half year, years, roughly. Um, isn't it that lifestyle medicine could be part 
of health and longevity medicine? Well, I mentioned before, one of the reasons that I came to X was to create this sort of community that sort of self-corrects, uh, where I need to be like a croupier and like there's some diplomacy when you're moderating. So you're sure. not, and then you can introduce bias too. So I'm very selective when I speak up, even when I might have strong feelings about certain things that, um, but so the, the, the other reason I came to, uh, one of the other major reasons is, uh, I, from my whole life, I felt exercise, diet, nutrition, before I even, you know, delved into, before 2009, the rapamycin ITP study, well before then. Um, so we, lifestyle medicine is, I'm just thinking how, how to, how to phrase it. Anyway, so the reason I came is because I believe that they are not only compatible, but they want to come together. So yeah. if for people who follow me at X, they'll notice something interesting from my very first post, very first post, they're about geroscience and, and, uh, and they were about, uh, lifestyle medicine. Those were my two themes from the very beginning. Because I didn't see anyone. I saw there were some fantastic, in fact, high, you know, uh, higher median quality. Because it's a, but a less, but more specific, layering on like aging biology on X. But that's very focused on aging biology. I wanted to expand it because I see these things as inextricable links. I think we they, we need each other. So one of my little secret ploys, also creating this a secret ploy, is I wanted to bring in people from. Uh, lifestyle medicine to learn about geroscience and aging biology and to discover we are allies because some are averse to taking pills. And I agree, we shouldn't throw pills at, at problems we could be addressing, but why not take the best of both worlds? That's my, my vision for healthy longevity. So we take the best from each of them and apply them both maximally. So lifestyle is absolutely the pillar also for the interventions for health and longevity medicine. Let's go to precision medicine. So yes. precision medicine is really stratifying based on risk of based on certain criteria, uh, the population to find the right diagnostics and interventions at a certain time in their course of their condition or, or disease. And I think precision medicine is absolutely agnostic of in terms of the topic. So would you agree with me that we should thrive for a precision medicine of precision health and longevity medicine? Yes. Um, I, I, I think what we need precision, we, I, I use the, the definition from upskilling the physicians of tomorrow is one example where that was incorporated there and unpacked it precisely because uh, what's you know we, we uh, you know we don't all have two and a half kids or whatever the statistic is if you apply two and a half kids not only would that not be applicable to most people be applicable to nobody we are not the average of our data and the better we're able to integrate data uh, whether it's um, methylation clocks or other omic markers or, you know, work from Snyder, different agiotypes to think at a systems level, the uh, temporal relationship between different organ systems with one and all our functional capability. Our, these all play in. The more granularity we have in the data, good data, and understand the way they're interconnected in the systems of biology, the more we can say, not like, oh, we'll give you what works for the average person, but what optimally works for me, we want that. And we also want that at a personal level. Yeah. I believe in patient empowerment and something I, I enjoy about being a longevity coach and consultant is you can, I can actually, what in my mind is like, I think of as a medicine 4.0 instead of yeah, 3.0. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, we will come back so, to Like that. you can really dig, dig, <laughs> dig to really get to know the person that well. And I think that's a challenge, but I'm hoping that a combination of an AI and an interdisciplinary team where, uh, where we can integrate that so patients are more empowered and there's more interaction rather than they're given a document and say, here, now you do this. But maybe they work with, with coaches and maybe they have nutritionists. Yeah, but we agree precision health longevity medicine is the way to go. Last uh, last item there is evidence-based. You already um, mentioned Sackett, uh, who really showed you need the evidence and you need also to know what people want and, and put it in their environment. Absolutely agree with you. 
we have to work on the on the evidence. But in the end, do you agree with me that we should really work towards evidence based precision, healthy longevity medicine with lifestyle as one of the pillars? Absolutely. I, I, in fact, I, in fact, this talk was my vote because if we rewind, that was that those you would hit the nail on the hit in the head, all the 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 major themes that where we unpacked an individual slide. So I, I am a true believer. Uh, so and the fact that two uh, uh, intelligent members of the Jira science communities independently. Are, are converging on this. I think I, I think this is the bleeding edge of where we have to go. And one day people will be watching our feature together and uh, they'll be saying, yes, this was this is when we it started me coming to the limelight. Perfect. I would love to learn a little bit more about your healthcare coaching because I know you're a dermatologist. You looked at skin. If you're entering a room, you think, wow, this is a disease. What do you do different now working really in the coaching space? And how different is that from your dermatology practice? Um, mm -hmm. And how much do you do in terms of diagnostics? Do you also already implement hallmarks of age or biomarkers of aging? Tell me a little bit more. It's a very interesting question. Uh, there are... There are obvious similarities in terms of knowledge base, uh, the requirements for things to be very, very uh, precise to have solid frameworks, which I don't, you know, I'm, I'm the son of an engineer and people are, oh, are you a com computer? So, you know, the, the way my mind works. So all those things are are, are assets to both. But um, I, I think we need to... Uh, 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 on peace. I have the the licensure and co coverage and so forth to practice concierge longevity medicine, but I've chosen uh, at at this time to act within the capacity of a coach or consultant in that, i.e. not write prescriptions. And actually, in the capacity for my longevity coaching and consulting, I see myself as most of my clients, they're people like physicians, some of them who prescribe rapamycin and other things themselves, and they want to take a deeper dive with me where I follow the, the aging biology literature in a lot more depth uh, in terms of the connections. Others are individuals who are... Um, uh, basically, uh, they already have a longevity medicine team. They already have a practitioner or a longevity center or clinic. And what they come to me as someone where they have direct one-on-one -on -one time is an objective uh, adjunct complement. I don't accept any affiliate marketing. I don't accept any sponsors, no associate, where I look at that data and I bring in the rele relevant research, not to tell them what to do because I don't give medical advice, but we hone in on such specific things in terms of their circumstances as well as their goals so they can make more informed decisions. So I see myself as a complement uh, to the longevity physician that they follow already. Yeah, fantastic. Over to Nandi. Anandi Shao is our student at NUS, and I see that we have lots of questions already from the audience. So um, please, Nandi. Sure. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Prof. Andrea. And thank you, Dr. Bazilai, for the fascinating presentation. Let's now take a look at the questions from the floor. Okay. So uh, our first question for you, Dr. Bazilai. Since everyone ages at different rates, how can people know when they should start seeking longevity medicine, whether there's a need for that? I have a little bit of a, a unconventional view about this. My belief is that the biologic aging uh, starts very young. They're different depending on how we define aging. Uh, you know, there's great work out of Vadim Gladyshev's lab in Harvard where at least if we look at methylation clock markers, there's a particular phase of development before birth where there's a sort of scrub, deep scrub of our methylation age that was a residual still on the sperm and egg that that um, made the, the embryo, which was to be an embryo, that it already starts there. And when we look at life, different things change over time. 
uh, when we're in our 40s, certain aspects of our eye shape change with some variation. Uh, when is our mat peak muscle capacity? Well, that's that's in our kind of in our late 30s or some 30 to 40, somewhere around age, actually early, around age 30, I should say, early 30s. Uh, then we ask, when do we perform most athletically, best athletic in our 20s? When do we have the fastest reflex? That's younger yet. So it's a process. I see a world, and this is a little, you know, I'm not saying everybody should be signing up their kids for longevity camp, but I do believe as a society, we should be thinking about a whole life course trajectory to optimize, like my analogy from this talk. Uh, and this is also an analogy that's been used in the financial planning literature. I, I, I have a kind of MBA financial planning background. And I think it's useful to think about not just whether you're in Paris instead of in Singapore, poor United States, but when you just get a little bit off course to instantly uh, track it. So I see a future where this is incorporated in our whole lifetime um, or, or today, as soon as we feel sort of ready for it. And the concept is by tracking these deep, uh, uh, whether it's omics, functional markers, everything, everything imaging, by tracking them when we have a little bit of a deviation or a little risk for disease or pre-disease or pre-pre-disease or something that's less than optimal or capable of, we know how to intervene we do, and we do so early. And by doing so early, it never gets to worse states where we have less capability for dressing because the earlier we treat it, the better we do. So one liner is as early as is possible that is agreeable to you. I see. Wonderful insights, Dr. Brazilai. Um, so, as we all know, you are at the forefront of advocacy for longevity and lifestyle medicine. But how can we start to encourage the public to maintain healthy lifestyle as a medical approach? It's not easy to drink everything sugar-free. I agree. It's a complex issue because I believe there uh, there's a balance uh, between... Um, uh, regulation, incentives, choice, all those things. But I do believe that we we don't live our lives in vacuums. The, 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 for example, the food, uh, the eating milieu, uh, we've increasingly, since the agri agricultural revolution, bred foods that are more and more calorically dense. And then we developed manufacturing processes, which can be very useful in some regards in terms of uh, from a cost or shelf life. We, we shouldn't throw out the baby with a bath water like Kevin Hall and others are noting when they're looking, is there some way to process it better? My ideal is like a whole foods diet as much as we can, but so there, there's going to be a range. So the question to me is in a food environment where every single company is like competing against one another, to, for people to buy as much as possible. And because we're evolutionarily wired to get those quick calories, the high glycemic load or the high nutrient density, take out the fiber and the water and, and to have an optimal bliss point and the, the food science of it, uh, we need to be thinking about ways of incentivizing behavior, I think at a regulatory level and also increasing consumer awareness and knowledge, uh, but in a way that's not onerous and is both uh, is cost effective and beneficial for society as a whole. And I believe we need to be making investments uh, as a society in geroscience, aging biology, and its translation and the kind of work that Brian Kennedy and Andrea Meyer are both spearheading at NUS as true international leaders. We need to be funding it. And by funding it, we're able to uh, sort of uh, have proper interventions. That same thing for preventative medicine, public health, community medicine, uh, campaigns, uh, but also we need to be thinking, aligning all incentives so everybody's speaking together. We have re uh, regulatory bodies. This is true for to approve GEAR protectors. We have advocacy groups. We have uh, the, the scientists. We have industry. We want the, all to be working in the same team towards the same objective, which is to have healthy longevity for everybody. Um, so my, my, so my short answer is working together intelligently at multiple levels, balancing proper ethics, efficiency, uh, choice, and encouragement. 
I see. That's fascinating, Dr. Brazila. Uh, so basically, there's another question regarding longevity medicine itself. So uh, most of us, we actually seek help when we do not feel well and we become sick when we go to the clinic. Is it How is it different from sick care to where people actually try to cure the conditions to, the, uh, to extend their health span? You know, there was a little controversy on X to what degree is primary care as it exists today already longevity medicine. I think it's a little bit of unfair question in that you can define longevity medicine different ways. You can define primary care different ways, and you'll have overlap at the individual levels. Um, I, it, with regard to people seeking out care, um, I, I do believe that aspects of longevity medicine are already integrated in primary care doctor, but the primary care setting, but incompletely by far, far, far and away. Um, so a lot of what's done in longevity medicine is not just waiting until you develop symptoms or to have an annual check or screening at a certain frequency. And certainly there's, uh, as a, as a, a diplomat of the ABLM, like there's a there's a ton that's integrated primary care following guidelines. But at the same time, uh, we're, we're so busy in primary care that uh, a lot of it is like playing whack-a-mole with different diseases. And how much time are we spending really guiding people, like how to be effective in their diet, uh, how to be, uh, how to effectively educate themselves to be good consumers of education? Like, you know, I try to on X for people to be exposed to this. I want people to be able to critically appraise information because there's so many different incentives out there and just misinformation, whether people intend it or not. It's a really, we need to protect ourselves. So uh, basically I think that uh, it should be integrated, not just in the clinic, but also, but longevity medicine to be integrated into primary care doctor uh, settings. To me, the ideal is that something for people at all, all economic means, universal access. And I believe investing at the state of art is going to get us there as well as thought. And the other thing I will add, which I glossed upon for the sake of time, is that um, now we have wearables, so we can get data at an outpatient basis. My ideal is that we have, we're able to get as detailed levels in real time, as well as access to, to talk to people, to get help, you know what I mean? Um, in real time, as things arise, and for there to be little flags, to, to, and even AI assists. Now we already have AI interpreting data for us to have outputs, but how about I noticed for the last few weeks, you've been starting to have, you know, a, a little, you know, you've been having a, a, a little less nuts and you've been having more of this sort of nut bar, which is, has, you know, high fructose corn syrup embedded in it. And, um, you know, we have to have ways of implementing it, but I, I really think these sort of social, uh, what are called an economics nudges, good kinds, uh, they can be phenomenally helpful, real-time healthcare, including at home. Thank you so much for your responses, Dr. Brazilai. That's all we can entertain for the question from the floor. I'll now pass it on back to Prof. Andrea. Thank you. Thank you so much. A wonderful uh, discussion. And I'm so happy that you said health and longevity is for everybody and that we also agreed that we should really work towards evidence-based, precision, healthy longevity medicine. I think that's uh, the future. That's, that was my vote. <laughs> Thank you so much. There is one week left for you, the audience, to register for the Unlock Healthy Longevity Supplement Conference, the first global scientific conference focused on the role of supplements as geroprotector at the 29th of February and the March of uh, the 1st of March here in Singapore. Join us, learn from the best of the best, Dr. Nia Basilai, David Sinclair, and many, many, many more. On Saturday, the March the 2nd this year, we are organizing a special open day for the public talking about top supplements. What is the evidence? How much and what should somebody take, if at all? What is the quality of supplements? You can find information in the chat box in, in, on the slide. Professor Brian Kennedy will host um, the next session, uh, and our guest will be Professor Ricardo Marioni of the University of Edinburgh at the 7th of March. We, as always, close with the final video. What 
is your goal in life. Take care. To be like one of the first petite Victoria's Secret Angels. To find somebody to spend the rest of my life with. I would like to raise a family and I would like to have a career that I'm passionate about. To win an Oscar. To be okay with where I'm at in my life. To always wake up with a passion for the day that's going to come. Just to be a good person. Live life to the fullest. Um, don't take anything for granted. To be a really good mother to my children and be the role model for them. Just to be happy, man. To make a difference. Live a very long time, very healthy. World domination. To be content. Stay happy. Be happy. To be happy. To learn as much as I can about myself. Be in control of myself. Continue to have my health. I believe I've already done that. Um, well, not, not totally completed it, uh, but I've uh, retired early, uh, bought a place in Manhattan, and I'm living here and enjoying. To make a living singing and acting. <laughs> my goals right now are mostly for my son. When I die, I don't want to regret not having done things. Right now is happiness. To help others to be happy. I want to try and make life better for someone else. I just look forward to, actually, most of my days. It's, it's a good time. To leave something behind that people will say, oh, yeah, she was here. To stay calm and not panic. To make a difference. Like, uh, to win an uh, Oscar. <laughs> I aim to live each day with an appreciation. To be as much as myself as I can. I want, I want to be happy. I want to make the people around me happy. I want to go out with my boots on. Uh, I want to keep moving. I'm feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless. Like I'm gonna make it And nothing in the universe can take this I can see it clearly now Nothing gonna bring me down 